second coming, Matthew 24. Matthew 24 contains the Olivet Discourse uh, when the Lord tells his disciples how it's going to be in the future. Uh, there are certain segments that are critical for eschatology, the book of Daniel, the Olivet Discourse, and the book of Revelation. Uh, you can get most, uh, you'll have to throw in 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Uh, our whole eschatological scene, a uh, whole's a little large. Most of our eschatological uh, interpretation comes out of the book of Daniel, the Olivet Discourse, 1st uh, and 2nd Thessalonians, and the book of Revelation. If you handle that, you've handled the main books that deal with prophecy. That's why in our great prophecy book, uh, study that you will take one day uh, called Daniel Revelation, it's one course. If you put Daniel and Revelation together, you've got the bulk of prophecy. That has very little to say about the church and the rapture, however. So that's where you go to First and Second Thessalonians, where you get the truth concerning the rapture, which is distinct from the second coming to establish the kingdom. <coughs> Tribulation takes place. Now, there's a title you must know. The day, day of the Lord. Look, there are three days. The judgment seat of Christ up above in 2 Corinthians 5 can be called the day of Christ. It's called that a couple of times. Day of Christ. That's the judgment seat of Christ. It's the that day that Paul is referring to so often in 2 Timothy. That day. That's the day of Christ. That's our day of reward. The day of the Lord is a bigger title. It grows out of the minor prophets where God is involved in direct judgment on the nation of Israel. Eschatologically, prophetically, the day of the Lord is a thousand seven years. It includes, as you look at the usage of it in the Old Testament, it includes the whole tribulation period and the entire millennium. The day of the Lord is a thousand seven years. If you are a wild-eyed environmentalist, and I have been an environmentalist before it was even customary to be one. When my father would take me out to the baseball game at Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, which we did quite frequently, his bank had a box and he could get tickets quite regularly, and we went out and had a wonderful time uh, enjoying the game. He would not allow me to throw peanut shells on the floor of the stadium because there's a receptacle where you can put that stuff called a trash can. We were genuine environmentalists. We took care of God's green earth. Wouldn't waste things. Wouldn't waste food. Wouldn't throw a paper trash bag out the window full of McDonald's leftovers. That would be a distinct no-no. Uh, so, you know, Christians are always environmentalists. Before it was customary. I used to like green. Green was one of my favorite colors. I hate green now. And they're turning everything green. Uh, you know, you, now you've got bottles to put your bottled water in so you don't, that's green. So you don't have to throw away your plastic bottles, which is one of the major reasons we have problems with, with uh, carbon kind of stuff, because we're buying all these stupid bottles. Do you re realize what's on the box of, back, of the back of those bottles? This water came out of the Denver water supply. That's the truth. If you're in Denver, you could fill up your own bottle with it for nothing. And we buy it for more expenses than it costs gasoline. That's another whole thing. We're, we're all environmentalists, folks. We all are as Christians. And we know this good earth is going to be here for at least a thousand seven years, no matter what we do. You understand that? It's not going to go away. It may get worse. It may get colder. It may get hotter. It's going to go through a lot of cycles. I was watching uh, the little ice age that was on during the uh, 1500s, uh, one of the real causes of the Black Death, because there was such a variation in temperature. It was cold then. They could be praying for some global warning. Well, it came. Uh, in my lifetime, they, they had a, a big scare of Time magazine. This was just back in the 60s, 50s, in that period of time that we're going to be frozen to death. Now we're going to be cooked to death. It keeps going like that. And it will for at least 1,007 years more. At least that long. Perhaps longer. We don't know when the Lord's going to come. We did that yesterday. But... The day of the Lord is a thousand seven years. All of the tribulation, 
all of the millennium. Now, the reason we say that is that's the way it's described in the Old Testament. Both the tribulation period is called the day of the Lord, and that golden era of this earth's existence, the millennium, is called the day of the Lord. Look at it this way. A day. Let's say a day begins at midnight. It's dark. That's tribulation. And then there's a sunlight. Make it the longest day. Not December 21st, the shortest, but the longest, mostly sun. And then at the end of the day of the Lord, there's darkness again when, when God, for his own purposes, and we'll get to that today, releases all the demons and Satan, and there's another great war, and then he creates afresh. So it begins with darkness, it ends with darkness. In between is virtually a thousand years, maybe 995 years of bright, blazing sunlight. Not literally, but a good, glorious reign of Christ on this earth. Okay, the day of the Lord, 1,007 years where God is involved directly in the judgment on this earth, good and bad. That's the way it was used in the minor prophets. You'll see, this is the day of the Lord, and the locusts come in and destroy the land. And then it's restored. So we understand that there's this non-technical use of the term to describe a localized judgment, direct intervention of God, <coughs> particularly in the minor prophets in the Old Testament. But as you look at the broad teaching of it throughout Scripture, the day of the Lord is that 1,007-year period, beginning with the, tribula uh, with the tribulation, seven years, then another 1,000, the millennium. Begins with darkness, ends with darkness, in between the great glorious millennial kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ. Day of the Lord. The day of God occurs only in Peter, Second Peter, where he, as you see on the right-hand section all the way to the right, where he destroys the heavens and the earth and creates a new heavens and a new earth. When the day of God shall come, that's equivalent to eternity. Day of Christ, judgment seat of Christ. Day of the Lord, 1,007 years. Day of God, the new heavens and the new earth created afresh, and uh, that is the statement of eternity. Peter will say of that time, Righteousness will finally find a home. There'll be no more sin. Day of God. Okay, so the Lord Jesus returns uh, at the end of the tribulation to establish his millennial kingdom. We were at the judgment of the nations, really the judgment of the goat and sheep. Goats being the unbelievers during the tribulation, the sheep being the believers during the tribulation. When he returns... He will return with all of his holy angels and with us. And we will come back to uh, be with him here on this good earth. Have you ever thought about that? Most of the time we are so caught up with the rapture, uh, caught up with the rapture, that we, we don't think of ever being back on this good earth. We're on this good earth for a thousand years. We go to heaven, we're with him in heaven for seven years, judgment seat of Christ, we're enjoying the bliss of heaven. Uh, which is only vaguely uh, spoken of in Scripture. We're enjoying that uh, for, for all of that time uh, in our glorified bodies, walking the streets of gold, all those nice hymns you know about it, uh, most of them out of our imagination. Uh, I've got a mansion just over the hilltop. I'm not so sure about that. But whatever it is, we are enjoying it for that seven-year seven period while on earth, literally all hell is breaking loose. And then when that is done, the Lord comes back, establishes his kingdom, we come back. He promises us. We, he has made us a kingdom of priests, and we shall rule with him on the earth, on this good earth. Don't you look forward to that? I, I'm, a, I'm as excited about that as I am going to heaven for the seven years uh, while tribulation is going on down here. We'll come back and be on this good earth. Now let's get straight how the millennium starts out. Judgment. Judgment of the nations. All the people in the tribulation, after the battle of Armageddon, all the people who are alive out of the tribulation, <coughs> excuse me, are called back. Uh, co I'm sorry. Are called to the judgment. And he determines. Uh, uh, Zephaniah has this scene. Multitude and multitudes in the valley of decision. We're all, they're all there. And they are determined by their works as to their salvation. Oh, you can enter the kingdom because 
uh, you took care of my brethren in the tribulation. How did I do that? You gave them a cup of water. Oh, yeah, I, I do believe in that. I was protecting. That's right. Evidence, real faith. You're the sheep. You, sub, you stand over here at the right hand. Uh, you didn't. You stand over at the left hand. He'll do that for all the Jews, all the Gentiles. And for all those goats, is what they're called, those people in the parable who were antagonistic to the Messiah, who were calling out the gospel of the kingdom, who were calling out against him, blaspheming in the name of tribulation, uh, they will be dispatched to the bad place. All the rest will remain to enter the millennium. When it says two are grinding, one is taken, one is left, the taken one, I think, is taken for eternal judgment. The one left is left to enter into the millennium. So as, we, as he finishes this judgment up, the battle of Armageddon has taken place, Christ is victorious, this great judgment is set up, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, the judgment of the sheep and the goat, the goats are dispatched to hell, the rest are then entering into the tribulation. They'll be just like you and I are, believers with these kind of bodies, non-glorified bodies. They will bear children. They will be mom and dad believers. They will bear children who will be pagans, unbelieving children. But they will be mostly saved. Not all, but mostly. Why wouldn't they be? We'll see about that in a little bit. That's one group that enters the millennium. You will ask the question, what about the little children? Well, I think if you're believing mom and dad, your little children go into the millennium too. I have no verse for that. I don't think it's just adults that go in. That's why, as I mentioned, he can say of the uh, elder bishop in the church, he must have believing children. In God's great sovereign workings, he relates on a family basis, and you're all proof of that. Any of you in a family where you are in your entire extended family, the sole believer, anybody like that? See, that's about four people out of all of us. Here's the deal. Once you marry, and I can tell some of you are planning on that, once you marry and bear children, you can be sure you'll start the same thing that has happened to the rest of the people. We've had testimonies in our Acts class. It's been kind of thrilling. Most of them were saved before they can even remember clearly. Some just recently out of an unbelieving home. But most like that. Once you marry as a Christian, marry another Christian, even if you don't have a perfect family, and none of us do, normally all the kids become believers. There's a covenant relationship some way or another. The faith that was first in your grandmother, then in your mother. And I'm persuaded in you also, Timothy. Now, we know we don't pass it along, but there is a connection. It's a wonderful connection. So, you see coming out of the tribulation, uh, 144,000 Jews, Revelation 7, who were saved, sealed to go through the tribulation, enter into the millennium. You see uh, their whole families. You'll see unsealed Jews who, uh, who were at the end. It's just not that, only that many. Multitudes of Gentiles. A lot of evangelism. In the, in the tribulation period. The witnesses are there, after all. And a lot of folk enter in just like us. They will bear children. They're the ones out of which the uh, population of, of people with a sin nature still will be generated. Most of them will come to know the Lord. Uh, the New Covenant says you will not have to say, know the Lord, for every man shall know the Lord. You don't have to witness to your neighbor. Good grief, Jesus is on television every night giving a weather forecast, and he says, this is the way it's going to be, and that's the way it's going to be. Is it going to rain on my parade? I'm sorry, you, you, you can have that parade. I'll keep it from raining there. It'll rain on either side of the street. That's how controlled things will be. He will cause the rain to fall the way he wants it to. The desert will bloom like a rose. It won't be the Sahara Desert. It will be the Sahara Forest. Or garden, if you prefer. You know, that's the way it's going to be. There are going to be renovations in the millennial period. But here are these people that come in. We have come back with the Lord Jesus to reign with him on the earth. So all the people from the day of Pentecost onward to the rapture, church members are here on earth with him. We come back with him. 
look at the resurrection line. In Daniel 12, after the tribulation, all the Old Testament saints are resurrection, resurrected to enter into the millennium as well. Abraham will be there. Isaac will be there. Jacob will be there. David will be there. Ezekiel. Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Michael, Nathan, Habakkuk, and Seven, Haggai, Zachariah will be there. Lamentations will... Oh, no, that's not a book. <laughs> They'll all be there. All God's people. Abel. All those folk onward. All Old Testament saints will be resurrected at the end of the tribulation period to enter into the millennial kingdom. Here on earth. Isn't this going to be fun? Are you enjoying this yet? You understand? All the holy angels will come back with him. Now there'll be responsibilities in heaven. God the Father, God the Holy Spirit, but primarily, understand they're omnipresent, but localized there. The Lord Jesus is here on earth, sitting on the throne of David, ruling over the 12 tribes of Israel and the rest of the world as well. There is still activity in heaven. Heaven is still occupied. And the angels will be ascending and descending, and so will we, according to whatever assignments we may have during the millennial period. All God's people here on earth. It starts out in Hebrews chapter 12, <clears throat> when everything is settled. The author of Hebrews says, we, not, we have not come to Mount Sinai that trembles with smoke and fire and everybody's frightened, but we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem now here on earth, a, a, a reconstructed Jerusalem with Jesus uh, sitting on the throne. Now it'll take some time right at the beginning of the millennium or end of in between tribulation and millennium, however that works, ill-defined. But uh, here's this new beautiful heavenly city here on earth. finds its origin in heaven. And uh, it says, we have come to the heavenly Jerusalem, come down from heaven. Here on earth, it's God's city now on earth where he dwells with us. And we have come to the spirits of just men made perfect. That's the Old Testament saints now perfected because... The New Testament saints are with them. We have come to the spirits of just men made perfect. We have come uh, to the holy angels, all the holy angels in festal array. They have on their dress uniforms for this first great celebration. The, the church of the firstborn is there. We have come to God, the judge of all. We have come to Christ, the mediator of the new covenant. All God's people, all the smoke of the tribulation settled down. Jerusalem's rebuilt. The heavenly city is here. The angelic hosts are with us. All the Old Testament saints are here. We are there, members of the body of Christ. The Father is there. The Son is there. The Spirit in Hebrews 12 is not mentioned, but he's there. He's, a, remember, the timid member of the Trinity. He does not call attention to himself. And Jesus is there. And it goes on to say, and the blood of sprinkling which speaks better things than the blood of Abel's sacrifice. Jesus said to his disciples, I will not eat this meal, this Lord's Supper with you, until I eat it afresh in the kingdom. And when all God's people and all the holy angels are there for the first time, Psalm 22 is fulfilled where the psalmist referring to Jesus says this, I will leave praise in the midst of the congregation. For the first time in the history of this earth, the Lord Jesus will be here on earth with all of his people, and we will have a great breaking of bread ceremony. The blood of sprinkling, the symbolism, this is my body, which I gave for you. He said, I'll eat it again with you in the kingdom. This is the cup, which symbolizes my blood. And there will be the millions of God's people and we will have a unique role there. We are a kingdom of priests. Not all of them are priests. We are. And we will have a priestly role in that uh, initial worship meeting of all of God's people. Do you look forward to that? That is going to be unbelievable. Think of the angels singing, holy, holy, holy. I hope they use our tune so we know it, you know. It's going to be great. All of God's people. That's where the millennium begins. A renovated earth. As close to before the fall as you could get it. Satan is bound. The demonic hosts are bound. All the bad people are still in the bad place. Only God's people on earth. 
There won't be people saying, uh, as they are in uh, Washington State, in the Capitol Building of Washington, they have this uh, right next to a Christmas nativity scene in the Capitol Building. They have an atheist uh, uh, demonstration place. There is no God. Religion is the opiate of the people. Just wait. <laughs> Just wait. Every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, whether in heaven or earth or under the earth. They will be under the earth confessing Jesus as Lord. Uh, we get the last word in. God does in the whole process. So here we are. Now, what about my pet dog? Are there animals in the millennium? Yes, there are. That's going to be fun. And here's a great verse out of Scripture. It's not just a spiritual thing. Where the lamb will lie, lie down. Here's where prepositions are very important. With the lion. Not in the lion. There's a big difference. Big difference. You know. And, and that's the way it's described. There is peace. That's the way it was in the Garden of Eden. The animals were all there. God, you know, uh, he made the animals. Before he made woman, he made all the animals. Right? And uh, Adam named them. I, I wonder, this is a mystery to me. Some people have great trouble with biblical principles. How could Adam have given them all those Latin names before Latin was even on the scene? Can you explain that to me? He, gave them all, he named them all. And they were his companions. And they were nice. But not perfect. And when God created woman, Adam said, wow, this is perfect. And, and that's right. The perfect match. That's what God did. A compatible match. A, a, a female human being. So there were animals all over the place in the Garden of Eden. And you see... You see even the snake. Uh, the thing that shocks me about that one is the snake comes up to Eve and talks to her, to her, and it seems like that wasn't unusual. I don't know how to explain that verse either. I think Eve should have said, what are you doing talking? Or maybe Dr. Doolittle was right. Uh, and maybe the guy that whispers to the horses is right. Or maybe they're smarter than we think before the fall. They are doing studies on animals and their communication. You know that. And, and you know the poodle is the smartest dog. And they think they understand the, the sounds that the poodle makes. They almost have the first sentence. And here's what it is. They have translated it out of poodle talk into understanding. Here's, why do you cut my hair like that? <laughs> it's, it's what the poodle is trying to say to us. Animals will be there and they will be peaceful. They'll all be domestic. Now, I'm not, sure, I'm not sure how that impacts on the food part of it. Uh, also, on, it seems like the sacrifices in the Old Testament are continued as a memorial to the Jewish people. In the book of Ezekiel, uh, you have the whole uh, priesthood reorganized, Old Testament priests where they live, where the temple is, how they do the sacrifices. It seems to be memorial, like the bread and the cup are memorial. We may well continue that in the tribulation as a picture. You'll say, why do, why do we need a picture? Why do we need a picture when we have Jesus with us? Why do we need a picture of someone when they're with us? That's a dumb question. When you all go home at Christmas, are you going to go around your house saying, I'm here. Put the pictures away. You're not going to say that at all because the pictures will remind you of something out of the past. And one of the things I do regularly, I, all the albums of pictures that we have kept forever, all of a sudden have real significance to me this year. Real significance. Because I'm reminded of what Thanksgiving and Christmas were like when Melzi was here. And I look at them with real significance. I'm not going to throw them away when I get to the millennium. I hope one day in the millennium I'll be able to sit under a tree someplace with an album and look through all these pictures again. Memory's a great thing. When we meet with the saints of the Old Testament, we're not going to just talk about now and future. We're going to say, 
Jeremiah, what was it like in Jerusalem when it was under siege? Tell me about that, would you? Tell me how you could write, great is thy faithfulness. Under, won't that be fun to do? Well, we'll have a thousand years to do all that. The animals are there. All God's people are there. The angels are there. The earth is renovated. Weather is totally under control. And uh, we worship the Lord. Jesus shall reign. Where'er the sun doth its excessive journey run, his kingdom spread from shore to shore till moon shall wax and wane no more. Question? Yeah. Um, tell me about Mary and Mary. Yeah, those people, if, this is why I kind of wish I were a tribulation saint. Because uh, you'd be, uh, continue your marriage for a thousand years plus and all the family reunions. I love that. I love that concept. They deserve it. A saint in the tribulation deserves the biggest break, don't you think? And they'll have the whole millennium to enjoy family life. Think of a family reunion with a thousand seven years on your hands. A thousand. Man. Marriage in the millennium for us doesn't exist. This is the only time. They are neither given or taken after the resurrection, but are like the angels. I hate that verse. I don't mind hell. I, 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 that's right. But why don't you, Ken Daughters have a, a great statement, understanding that marriage doesn't exist on the other side for us. He says, I, I at least hope I can pal around with Carol. Well, I, I like that. It doesn't, there isn't marriage on the other side. For the people coming out of the tribulation, the kids will grow up and get married, bear children, all the rest of it. Not us. We have been changed in that way. And so for now, that's why. In Romans 6, it, it establishes the fact that <coughs> the marriage bond is only until death. That's why uh, it is per perfectly permissible to remarry after uh, one or the other of the spouses is lost. I have promised not to do that to my wife. And she said, I won't die unless you promise me that. So I shouldn't have promised her. No, but I, I have uh, bigger fish than that to fry at this point in time. And, uh, and I, uh, as I say, I'm as happy as a widow can, widower can be, uh, enjoying all the good things that are in front of me and some of the bad things from God's hand as well in, in the whole process. That's just the way life is. But it's perfectly legitimate, too. What, what the Sadducees said when they were trying to trick the Lord was, this poor woman married seven times, whose wife shall she be in the resurrection? And he said, you don't get it. There is a husband-wife relationship after resurrection. There's something better than that. And you just trust God that what is better is better. And it is. So, yeah, there'll be marriage, but only of the folk that come out of the tribulation. There'll be something. I don't, I don't think we're going to go through heaven. Oh, my. Boy, this, this is not heaven. <laughs> I don't know if they're fallen angels. I think that's probably true. We'll be judging the angels. The angels will be, hey, we're the priests. We tell the angels where to go to do their, their angelic singing at the worship services we're organizing. Talk about worship teams. Think of, think of having a myriad of angels uh, for the priests to arrange in worship. That's going to be fun. You know, I let my sanctified imagination go a little bit. But it says we'll, we'll rule over the angels. That's why, that's why Paul says you should be able to get along in the church. You're going to be responsible for administration of angels in coming days. They'll be your messengers, not only mine, but yours as well. We'll meet our guardian angel. Okay? So it's going to, it's going to be all this intermixing of all these different kind of folk. Other questions you might have? Millennial questions? thousand years of this. It's going to be wonderful. I just came across... Uh, in the book of Acts I was teaching yesterday, when, when God appeared to Paul, the third time Paul tells the story of his conversion, he says, and the voice came from heaven, Jesus came to him speaking Hebrew. So we know God speaks Hebrew. I, I have a hunch he speaks everything, don't you? I mean, he, he's the one that invented languages to confuse us. So I'm not sure what the language is going to be. Uh, maybe we'll all be multilingual. Maybe that's part of the glorified body. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Oh, sure it is. 
I know one inherently. I know bad English. The French know bad French. The German know bad German. We never get it straight. You know, that's just the way it is. Oh, who knows? There was one language once. You could argue for that because all languages have the same basic structure. Nouns, verbs, adjectives, you know, no matter where, it all has a similar. Just like we are all similar, so are all languages, and they go back to a beginning language to be sure. I don't know. Who knows? You show me a verse, I'll agree with it. It's that simple. Millennium. Well, it doesn't go that way perfectly forever. Now, there are a couple of good reasons for the millennium, aside from just to have the millennium. When, when God created Adam and Eve, he said, this is your dominion. Now, exercise dominion all over it. In the book of Hebrews, it says, we see not yet all things subject to man. All things have never been subject to man. This is when they, what the environmentalists are telling us. Men pervert and destroy creation. They don't bring it into submission. They mess it up. And that's right. We do not see all things under the submission of man. Man will take that drive to bring everything under his control and turn it into the Second World War, turn it into Auschwitz, turn it into the killing fields of uh, the Far East, turn it into chaos in trying to exercise dominion. We have a tendency to do that. It's all in twisted dominion. And the author of Hebrews will say in the middle of the Roman Empire, which was the closest thing never bringing in dominion, we do not see all things subject to man. Man has never done what God intended Adam as king of the earth to do. The millennium answers that question. The author of Hebrews says, but we see Jesus who one day will bring all of God's creation into submission. Man will fulfill man's destiny. That's one reason for the millennium, other than just salvation. Another reason is to show how bad man really is. How does the millennium show how bad man really is? Can anybody figure that one out? Yeah, and does it stay that way? It really gets worse. It, it, not only, nowadays we have secret believers. In those days, in the millennium, you'll have secret unbelievers. But they don't stay secret forever. When do they fly their colors? What happens at the end of the millennium? I have to tell you what happens at the end of the millennium. At the end of the millennium, Satan is loosed. Why in the wide world would God do that? You remember the chart that we had over Satan, how, how God sort of plays with Satan? Uh, first of all, after Satan sins, after Lucifer sins, he doesn't cast him out of heaven. He still is the accuser of the brethren all the way up until now. He can come sassying right into the presence of God with all the other angels when they come in for the daily report. And God says to him, have you considered my servant Job? Oh, man. You hope God never put your name into that kind of a sentence. Have you considered my servant? Boom. Well, uh, Satan said, no wonder. He said, look what y'all you've given. Well, go do whatever you want, but don't kill him. And Satan is accusing the brethren now. When we sin, he says, look at that guy sinning. It's one of your people. And the Lord has to intercede as our advocate right now. Right. There, because of that, he's able to save us to the uttermost. That's where Satan is now. Middle of the tribulation, God throws him out of heaven. You can't be here anymore. Splat, he's here on earth. And he goes after the nation of Israel to destroy it. He can't get the Messiah, but if he can get the nation, it's as good as getting the Messiah because God's covenants will be broken. God will be made a liar and Satan wins. So in his theological insanity, he goes after them. The Lord says, that, that's enough of that. After three and a half years of him roaming about doing all these terrible things under God's permission in the tribulation, he casts them into hell for most of a thousand years, along with the other demons. Now, at the end of the thousand years, he loses them again. You remember how he, he plays with him, like a cat in a mouth. Boom, 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 you know? It's the way it is. Turns him loose. And all these people who have been secret unbelievers are gathered together, Gog and Magog, and there's this great battle at the end of the millennial period. What does that show us about man? There's been no Satan for a thousand years, no demons for a thousand years, no world opposed to God. Sin comes from, here comes a question. It's 
So on the exam, what are the three sources of sin? Who can give it to me real fast? Three sources of sin. The world, the flesh, and the devil. Know that. It's one of the questions. So far, I've given you three questions. Okay? World, the flesh, and the devil. If you got the charts, you got all the questions. Okay? It's that simple. World, the flesh, and the devil. What about the world in the millennium, the world system? It's not there. It's God's system. What about the devil? He's not there. What's left? The flesh. It shows how bad a fallen man is. If you didn't believe in total depravity, if you don't believe in total depravity, that every part of man has been touched, that unaided by external uh, pressures, man would be horrible. Look at this. When you had a perfect king and perfect government, absolutely perfect enforcement of rules and regulations, you will never speed in the millennium. They won't have to have a, a, a camera up there to catch you going too fast. The omniscient Lord will not, zoop, there he goes, give me a ticket. Okay? There'll be perfect rules, absolute righteousness, in spite of no world system opposed to God, in spite of no demon and all, uh, Satan and all of his hosts, there's just that sinful man in the midst of millions and millions of believers at the end of that time, he still revolts against God. It proves how bad we really are when we are allowed to be who we are. And God does that. The end of the millennium demonstrates more than any other period how wicked man really is left to himself. Under perfect conditions, where we say, oh, the government made me do it. No, the government was perfect. It didn't make you do it. The devil, no, it's not the devil. He's been bound. It's you. You've had a perfect king on the earth for a thousand years, and you're still in your selfishness not accepting that. Me first. And that's what happens at the end of the millennium. It shows how bad man is. Even in a near-perfect condition, there is revolt at the end. Satan's loose, and you've got this little world system who... Satan loose for a little bit of time. And when that happens, God really does get ticked. And Peter talks about this. The first time he said, I'll not flood the earth. I, I promise never to flood the earth. There's a rainbow. But here's what I'm going to do at the end. I'm going to burn it to a crisp. You could wish you had the water of the flood. And he destroys the heavens and the earth. He's had it up to here. It's a terrible thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And God will execute his vengeance and destroy the whole thing. Create a new heavens and a new earth, Second Peter. Wherein righteousness finds a home. My wife used to ask a lot of good questions. One of which was will this ever all start up again bad again? That's a good question. Is this just a cyclical thing like heating and cooling? When he destroys this creation that he made and creates a new heavens and a new earth, will it ever again find sin entering in? And Second Peter it gives a, a rather direct, not totally direct, but rather direct answer. On this earth, Righteousness never really found a home. It was at the beginning for a little bit. In the millennium, it's 99% there, but then it still doesn't find a home. Uh, Peter will say he'll, he'll create a new heavens and a new earth wherein righteousness dwells, finds a permanent abode. And that's a very reassuring concept. There'll be no more death, no more tears, no more sorrow, no pain, no suffering. Stephen Charnock says, relating to our eternal life that we have through faith in Jesus Christ, we are simply in the vestibule of our eternality. We have not even yet entered into the celebration chamber. That's wonderful. 
and there'll be a thousand years of celebration on this good earth. And then a brief interruption. And then eternity, where righteousness finds a home. That's the day of God. New heavens, new earth. At the end of the millennial period, when all of this has happened, there is one great resurrection of the dead. This is called the second death. All who are unbelievers from, I guess I'd say Cain, I think probably Adam and Eve were forgiven. I don't think Cain was. But all unbelievers from the beginning of time on are resurrected at the end of the millennium. One giant resurrected resurrection and they are brought out of death to enter into what the bible calls the second death permanent separation from god the lake of fire death and hell are cast into the lake of fire described in horrendous terms of eternal isolation solitary confinement with memory with eternal thirst, with eternal flame, eternal torment, paying for your own sin. That's the way Jesus describes it in the story of the rich man and Lazarus. Loving Jesus describes it as eternal torment. And so must we. And that is real. It doesn't necessarily mean real flame but it does necessarily mean real flame-like pain, which is a throbbing, continuous thing. You know, have you ever been burned seriously? Isn't it horrible? It's a terrible thing. You can feel your heart beating all the time, wherever you're burned. It's always pain. You have to have medication. That's the way it's described. Deliver me from, deliver my brothers from this torment. That's what the rich man said. And uh, there is that terrible judgment that is coming. And there is a new heaven and a new earth where we will be forever in the celebration chamber for the saints.